Boa noite. Boa noite a Good todos. Good evening. Good evening, all the colleagues from ABOO, the Brazilian Association of Orthopedic Oncology, especially my colleagues, Dr. Antonio Marcelo, Dr. Olavo Pires de Camargo, and Dr. Glauco Pau Camelo. Thank you for your participation. And I would like to especially thank our collaborators, besides the Brazilian Association of Orthopedics and Traumatology, the Brazilian Society of Pathology, the Brazilian so uh, Society of on Clinical Oncology, and our sponsors, especially ImplantCast, supporting us in our webinar activities. Besides Acontece Eventos, which has uh, played an important role in all of our activities in our Congress, which will be held next year because of the pandemics, and which has helped in our webinars. And also OrthoPV Online, uh, a streaming, uh, content streaming company, helping orthopedic uh, surgeons around the globe in international webinars and seminars, and we are we are ha we're having our ABOO uh, webinar being broadcasted by them. We will have two other webinars ahead on July 12th and August the 14th. These webinars will take place monthly till April 2022, and the next one in July will, uh, July 12th, will be, uh, will be in, the, uh, in the place of, uh, of Antonio Marcelo's, Antonio Marcelo's uh, hometown, who uh, will we'll talk about Vanessa rotational plastic. And Dr. Michelle will talk about the parity study, and Dr. Reinaldo Garcia will talk about mega prosthesis complications, extremely interesting topics for many colleagues uh, here. In August 14th, João Paulo Fonseca from Coimbra, Portugal, talking about mega prosthesis, Dr. M Rodrigo Munoz talking about giant uh, cells of the tenosynovial tumor, and Dr. Burger from Essen in Germany talking about endoprosthesis around the knee. Now I'm going to call our chairman, Dr. Edgar Engel. Dr. Engel, the floor is yours. Good evening. Thank you, Ricardo. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Brazilian o Society of Orthopedic Oncology, I would like to thank the presence and participation of our speakers. And also, I'd like to thank our sponsors, ImplantCast and Ortho TV for this uh, program and the dissemination of our activities and the, by broadcasting, for broadcasting them and the participation of our pathologists and clinical oncologists. This interaction is very important because the diagnosis is never made by only one uh, expert. It depends on the interaction of these many uh, different pro professionals. It's very, uh, I'm very glad to know that these colleagues are taking part. I would like to thank doctors Antonio uh, Marcelo, Olavo, and Glauco, who are participants, key participants of our society, of our association, who are going to present very important talks. And, and I, in, on behalf of Renato, I, I would like to thank Acontece. The last time they helped us a lot, and today they are helping us as well. And they are helping us to provide you with this high quality events. And I would like to welcome all of our friends of ABOO and all of those interested in orthopedic oncology in Brazil and abroad who are going to watch us through Ortho TV. Thank you very much. Now back to you, Ricardo, who introduced us to our first speaker. I hope you enjoy this event. Thank you, Edgar, for your words. 
Actually, let me anticipate this. And before I introduce you to our first speaker, let me tell you that we have a chat for questions. If you have any doubts during the talks, you can send questions or comments through our chat window, okay? And I will try and select the questions. I mean, uh, ask the questions, your questions, to our speakers. Dr. Antonio Marcelo Souza, thank you very much for your participation. One of uh, esteemed members of our association from Recife, Pernambuco, who talk about Vaness rotation plasty uh, and a single center experience in Brazil. Certainly, uh, very, um, uh, uh, certainly very uh, unique in our country. Uh, Dr. Antonio Marcelo, the floor is yours. Well, good evening, everyone. Let me thank you for uh, remind, uh, remembering about my name and inviting me to be here. It's a pleasure to be here in, among these friends and being able to share our uh, joys and, and sadness in this pathway of orthopedic oncology. So let me share my screen with you. And let me tell the participants, the attendees, in general, that my slides are all in English, okay? So I, I believe it will be easier for um, all of our participants to uh, understand. Can you see my, my slides? Okay. So the experience in the Pernambuco Cancer Hospital is very important, I would say, not only in a, for our country, but also, I would say, for Latin America, because after some time that we came back from Germany, where we had the opportunity of seeing this, um, this procedure called Vaness rotation plastic, we started to see and diagnose patients with this possible indication or who could undergo this surgery. I've, I've been working at this hospital for the past 35 years, and we have this service of um, oncol oncological orthopedics. I am the oldest uh, physician there. And we have Antonio de Souza there, a colleague of mine who is also, who is also uh, an experienced colleague there. And the whole region there treats, um, treats patients oncologic patients there. So rotation plastic is a procedure that can be used not only for the resection of a, a tumor around the knee, but also a tumor compromising the whole limb. So it started, it's interesting because it started back in, the in 1930 by Borgrev who had this idea to treat TB patients. It was initially described to treat these patients. It was popularized during the, during the 50s by Van Ness. And after his publication, it was called, it started being called Van Ness surgery to treat uh, a focal femoral deficiency. Then in the 70s, COTS, uh, I mean, I, I had the opportunity of visiting uh, him in Austria, and also Dr. Sauser proposed this procedure for patients with osteosarcomas around the knee. Later, Winkelmann, during the 80s, using the, started using this procedure in, in Germany and extended this indication for patients who had tumors on their proximal femur and also the whole femur. Here in Brazil, we know that Professor Elio Constantino and Professor Pericles described two cases at the Santa Casa Hospital in Sao Paulo. Several other uh, professionals uh, have, um, have used, have relied on this pr procedure as well. Um, it's important to keep in mind some, some key papers, Borgrave, in 1930, Vaness in 1950, 
and published at jo Journal of Bone Joint Surgery, and then Drs. Kotz and Souser in 1982, and Dr. Winkelmann in 1996. These papers are very important. They are key, in fact, for those who, who are interested in this procedure to understand their history, indication, and possibilities. Basically, it's indicated for patients who have tumors uh, around the knee or whole femur um, for, to treat malignancies, uh, aggressive tumors, who cannot be treated in, using any other treatments. Uh, a very interesting indication is for children who have a great growth potential potential. And so the use of a prosthesis would not be ideal because this prosthesis cannot grow. And we know that in our country and in Latin America, uh, it's, a, it's a difficulty. It would be difficulty to indicate a procedure to, resic to resicate um, a prosthesis. Um, a tumor in a nine or 10 year old. In teenagers with intense sports activity, it would be a good indication given the possibility of going back to deambulate or going back to their own uh, gait or normal gait and going back to sports without being, uh, without that concern that we have for those who have endoprosthesis, for example. It can also be used for congenital focal femoral deficiency and for uh, salvage of other failed uh, procedures. And I am going to show you some of these cases so you can understand. So let, let us re remember or uh, talk about Winkelmann's classification. We have A1, 2, and B1. We basically, it's a tumor compromising the distal uh, and then the proximal tibia later in A2 and so on. I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, this is an scheme where you can understand this. B, see this in B3A in, in, in black, we can see the whole femur uh, attacked, affected by this. To avoid, we have to treat this to avoid this articulation and use a procedure to maintain a healthy distal uh, limb that can promote a better uh, protection without the weight of a disarticulation, a post, uh, a femoral disarticulation, which would uh, make patients wear crutches for the rest of their lives. So we can maintain only vessels and nerves and put put a prosthesis and later patients can walk again very reasonably. Uh, this is just to show you the first case. This, uh, we do not have the documents of the first case because the patient died of a metastasis six months later. But this is the second case of a patient um, who underwent this procedure. At the time, this patient was seven, seven years old. And you can see that the, at, to the left of the screen, you can see his x-ray, uh, pre-chemo, then post-chemo in the middle, and then on the, a picture of the patient to the right. So the, his response to the chemo was very good. We didn't have MRI available in the, in the public system, public health system back then. This was in 97. And then we based our treatment in the x-ray. So we wondered whether we should preserve any part of the proximal femur. We, we understood that the distal femur was affected and then we went on. These are the pictures of the time. This is a classical approach. And we use a flap distally using the tibia flap uh, to be enlarged and adapted to the 
thigh or the uh, hip. In, you can see the whole femur and especially the femoral head in the arter arteri artery sorry and the vessels together can you put down your camera a little bit so you can see your face oh, is, it, is it better oh much better i'm sorry so this is a x-ray of the surgical piece uh, cut in half so you can see clearly that this tumor was uh, getting close to the metaphysary zone, to the tro trochanter area. So I think our decision was right. You can see the pictures showing the active um, function of the patient's foot and then the, the provisional initial prosthesis. So these are some videos showing the the gate, and then the last video, sorry, let's go back there. The last video is the most recent. He doesn't need crutches, and these, this man here has uh, children. He, he is married for the second time. He works, I mean, he has a, he leads a normal life. Um, he doesn't seem that like that little seven-year-old uh, boy who, who, who had such a big problem back then. This is a patient who had an osteosarcoma. You can see that in his x-ray in the left side, you cannot see bone. And then after the chemo, there was a nocification of the tumor in spite of this pathological uh, act defect and you can see that the tumor goes to the distal part going to the head as you can see in the arrow and this is in the long run to the right back in 2007 a transformation of this tibia a tibia that in the past was plain plain the tibial plateau was plain but the nature teaches that it's on our side provided that we treat it well. And as we put the tibia along with the acetabulum and the boy was small, today he's 31 years old. But the, when this patient uh, started walking, he stimulated this tibia within the acetabulum. And then the acetabulum is concavus. And then the tibia needed to transform to, ad to adequate to the acetabulum. And then it was the tibia transformed into a into the shape of a femur it was no longer plain it looks more like a femoral head uh, and then you can see a, a x-ray of the, the the hip area and you can see this difference you can see his hip uh, his foot sorry a movement and then you can see the video this is a similar case of a patient uh, seen in a hospital in, in a peripheral area of Pernambuco. This is a fra fracture of, and the, the x-ray, we didn't see anything un abnormal. I mean, my colleague, the colleague that, that, that uh, saw him, and then he, they placed this uh, shaft, this rod. And then from November 2014 to September 2016, there is a reabsorption in the whole region in this, of these two screw. In September 2018, there was an intense lysis and a process a uh, tumoral process started showing, and this patient was referred to our center. And as if it wasn't enough, it's part of this huge mass in his hip. He had this, this rod, this infected rod. So the first thing to, before we perform uh, image staging, we remove this rod, we remove this shaft and the screws, and then we 
And then after we removed the, that stainless steel uh, shaft, we performed an MRI. You can see the tumor mass extends through the, the gluteums, uh, the, 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 the hip, very complicated case. Formal indication for a more ablative procedure. Obviously, we made a biopsy and the result was an osteosarcoma. We talked to the patient. He was a heavy patient, an adult patient. And four years in evolution, fortunately, no pulmonary, no lung um, metastasis. And then we told him, well, this is very hard because the margin is almost impossible to, to resect. I mean, to have a marginal uh, resection given the the size and then we we tried to convince him uh, to undergo a vanes rotation plasty and then and then we went on and you can see then we removed the whole femur this is the flap you can see the fibular being dissected. This is the bundle. And the completion after the, the distal part of the leg is adapted. The nervous uh, bundle is being adapted. This was the hardest case because of the extension upwards uh, next to the iliac uh, wing. This is the immediate post-op, the suture, the flap. In each, each flap is made according to the lesion. This is a scintillography pre and post-surgery. Uh, post -surgery. Once again, it was, you can see the patient walking post-op six months later with crutches in the third uh, video you can see him up walking it's not like a catwalk model i mean uh, walking but he can walk i mean he can he's uh, no crutches he's autonomous and no relapse uh, three years later uh, so you can take this into consideration not only for patients with malignant bone uh, tumors, but also uh, patients who have tumors affecting the whole femur and for salv salvage um, treatment. Our casuistic, 21 cases and 17 in our centers, one in the EMIP and one in Uruguay. We had the, 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 the happiness of being invited, being invited uh, to operate in Uruguay. I think it was six months ago. And I just got a video there from the case there and he's doing okay. And eight alive without uh, taking into account the case in Uruguay with a follow-up of two and 22 years. Cognitive, motor and sensitive functions close to normal. And we have uh, written some papers showing the functional uh, sides, the functional results and outcomes of these um, patients and they are uh, promising. And if you had done a disarticulation and our endoprosthesis or non-conventional endoprosthesis on a high amputation or any other procedures, I mean, all patients who died, they they died out of the uh, underlying diseases, for example, lung um, metastases and so on. We had one child who had a complication and he had to amputate. And but later, uh, seven months later, uh, the child died because of a metastasis and not because of the procedure. So. <laughs> I could conclude by saying that this procedure, the Vaness rotation plasty, uh, uh, reaches a high score on quality of life measures. Even if you use MSTS or TES, 
is good. The, there is a high functional score. There is a bizarre aspect, um, not to indicate it so much, but it's a relative um, idea because if we show videos and if you talk about the, the function after the surgery, this is important without talking about the, the countless uh, complications in which we use our fantastic endoprosthesis that in the long run or in the medium run will lead to complications or lead to infections or revisions or lead to um, amputations or abla ablations and so on. There are, uh, pr we have um, some studies comparing the ex Spent energy is uh, energy expenditure uh, of patients using prosthesis and vanes patients. Our patients they walk with the sensation that they are using their own food. It's not a patient who has been amputated. It's a patient who has a defect. A medical, physical defect or deficiency, but he feels the saw, the the ground under his foot, and uh, there is a low gate energy in comparison to mega prosthesis. And Dr. Tiago Bessa, for example, he has worked with prosthesis in, in in children, and he is available. He can work with patients. Uh, from other regions of Brazil and other regions. This is a video of some of our patients who managed to, to visit us in Carneiros Beach in Pernambuco. They are happy and proud about their, their legs. And we will probably have another meeting of, of more patients after this pandemic is over. So um, I'm almost done, yes. Uh, Thank you very much again. And now back to our chairman. Thank you very much. And I am available to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much. I would like to thank you, Professor Marcelo, for your class. Such an interesting procedure, uh, procedure that has its indications that helps from the functional standpoint. There are some true benefits. And I do have some questions. Um, well, have you analyzed the number of complications related to this type of surgery, this type of procedure? Do you have this number? I mean, can you tell us which are the main complications attached to it? Well, we have 22 cases, nine uh, alive. I mean, our cases and the, the Uruguayan. So complications would be uh, 50, 45% of the uh, patients, 45% of the patients uh, died, I mean, uh, because of metastasis, most, mostly of them. Uh, and in our patients who survived, they, uh, we have more neurologic complications. So we need to um, recruit well the patients. We need to analyze the patients before the surgery. Uh, there was a patient uh, in who I had a resection in his distal femur, in a frozen uh, distal femur. He lived, he was a earring sarcoma. And then years later, there was a resection, uh, but we needed to sacrifice, I mean, to, to remove the medium distal femur from the trochanter upwards. But I, the dissection was very hard. I, I evaluated a resection of vases. I needed a colleague to help me in that case. And maybe we would need a bypass. Most of the times it's not necessary. Well, infection are related to the graft. Well, I have a model patient here in our hospital, hospital, and he had a problem with scarring. He, there was, he had problems with the graft. Uh, we needed a, a negative pressure dressing, but after all, he, um, he, went, he was okay. Because this is a big surgery, it's part of the deal. I, have, I had never had massive thrombosis in any patient. I mean, we had this patient, this boy who, who died six months later because of metastasis, but 
Anyway, Ricardo, can I make a question, a quick question? Sure. My friend, Marcelo, I, I watched the many conferences in ASUS and MNTS. And when you turn 180 degrees, some, some of you uh, use anastomosis uh, because of this turning. In Germany, somebody said that there you must maintain some tension in the vasculus nervous uh, bundle. You just, uh, you don't do anastomosis, surgical anastomosis. You just uh, fold it. There is no problem of tension in the, in the bundle. Oh, look, Olavo. Up until now, we didn't need to uh, resect uh, the vascular bundle because we could uh, dissect the the v, the the vein the vim, the femoral vein so we don't need uh, resection in anastomosis because it would increase morbidity increase increase a lot morbidity a lot but but we we had a, a this adaptation of this uh, bundle because it's redundant up there it's a way of not uh, needing to resect. Otherwise, it would increase morbidity. But if the, the tumor uh, involve artery and veins, then you need to do it. Because otherwise, the, the foot won't work. Because the principle of the rotation plasty is, is not going to be employed. Edgar, please, you can move on with Professor Olavo. All right, so now let's move on to our next topic, which will be presented by Professor Dr. Olavo Pires de Camargo. He is a full professor at the School of Medicine of uh, Sao Paulo University, one of the pioneers in oncology, uh, orthopedics or oncology and also one of the first members of Brazilian Association of Orthopedic Oncology. He will talk about bone metastasis and pathological fractures in treatment guidelines. Dr. Olavo, I'm eager to listen to your class. Thank you very much. Well, just let me put my, my slides here. Obviously, I need to thank you for inviting me to be here. I, Marcelo, and Consentino, we virtually founded this association. So it's very good. I'm very glad to see how big and how important this association has become. In, we have 200 and plus members, and we have always um, taken part of MSTS and, and, and representing the Brazilian Association of Orthopedic Oncology. Uh, I mean, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for this opportunity to show my experience. And I will talk about a theme, a topic. Let me move on here. This book is the book I recommend to all oncological orthopedists are watching. This is our reference, a reference book. I've been following this from number one to this one, number four. And uh, the Brazilian uh, management uh, guidelines are, in, they keep up with this updates. Basically the international protocols in oncologic uh, ortho orthopedics are based on this book. I don't know if you're thinking about writing a book, but I don't think we should create a book on Brazilian uh, on ortho orthopedic on oncology. I think we have this one. So we have this new edition. And number one, let me tell you, the number one orthopedic knowledge update only had one chapter 
a three-page chapter on metastatic lesions and progressively it increased. Today, it has sub-chapters with four, uh, four chapters dedicated to bone metastasis. One whole section with four chapters talking about uh, upper limb, lower limb and diagnosis and basis for diagnosis. When I started, my father used to say, there's nothing to do. If you have cancer, if, if there's cancer in the bone, there's nothing to do. I, I used to listen to my father say, say this and other physicians uh, would say that in the past, but we changed the scenario. We can interfere in the life, in the lives of these patients with, with bone metastasis. Uh, and we, for example, oh, we would refer surgery uh, and then it, our, some colleagues would say, oh, you're going to disseminate this uh, we, if you do blocked uh, uh, surgery. Let me talk about in what we should uh, avoid is pathological fracture, especially secondary pathological fracture. This is why you should um, make an indication of surgery before fracture. This, let me talk about the social importance of cancer. This uh, cancer is the second largest cause of death in Brazil. It's ahead of COVID. Um, cancer is a social uh, issue in Brazil and we are no longer uh, a young country. Our population or the, the age group of 80 years or older is increasing. And the older the population, the higher the number of bone metastasis, close to all the other problems, other tumors related to thyroid or kidney and so on. And bone metastasis is the first in symptomatology and third in frequency. This lesion, almost invisible to the x-ray, uh, made it impossible for patients to move and to walk and generated a lot of pain. For example, disseminated lung metastasis and in the case of uh, hepatic, hepatic um, carcinoma would be different. And this, we know this because of a meta-analysis that we created. We need to rely on several um, types of treatments, radiotherapy, hormone therapy, chemotherapy, bisphosphonates and surgery. We cannot treat this isolately. This is obvious for us, of course, but some, some naive uh, professionals who are not orthopedic Orthopedic or oncological orthopedics, they may wonder what they, they could do, but this is for us to treat. Let me show you this. There was a metastasis and fixation in chemotherapy. Chemotherapy helped. This is a this is a, a, den, a breast adenocarcinoma, then pathological fracture, internal fixation and then post-radiotherapy. Our intervention makes it easier and consolidates uh, or helps consolidate the fracture. This is a breast carcinoma metastasis. Only uh, radiotherapy. There is a callus there and pain remains with the patient. So uh, it was treated by a professional who was not an oncological orthopedic. So this is a, um, this is, was a fixation without radiotherapy and four months after the, the surgery. We know that we have several uh, inhibitors of bone loss and I rarely um, prescribe isometa, but this helped us to, to decrease metastatic lesions. It's important to make use of them when needed. But surgery is the main treatment method to cure bone metastasis. 
it's palliative, but it's the main course of treatment. If, but many professionals uh, don't believe that. When they see a bone metastasis, they will uh, refer the patient directly to radiotherapy. It's, and in Sao Paulo, in Recife, in, May, in big cities, it doesn't happen so often. But in 85, in 90s, back in, I mean, in the past, we used to have this more, uh, more of this case. And which is the main goal of uh, the, this treatment, bone metastasis treatment, is uh, immediate stabilization, to fixate, fixate without consolidate. It's a paradox because we do not want to do what we normally want. It's not like what a traumatologist would do. We're not going to use an allograft uh, because we do not use that in a bone metastasis uh, surgery. Because in, this is incredible. There are some studies showing that increases quality of life and increases survival. Let me show you some examples. I am anticipating to Glauco's class. I'm sorry, but it's important to show how this situation evolved. Not the de development of orthopedists who devote their jobs to spine lesions and cervical lesions that treat uh, metastatic lesions in the spine, Dr. Jacobsen and Dr. Milton. These cases would take hours, like with a uh, very poorly done curettage, with a pedicular uh, screw and the thoracic, the thoracic uh, hook plus cage, he can be treated. I'm just showing how they helped and how they changed the course of treatment. I operated with Dr. Tarcizio and they used the curette in the fundus just to stabilize. This is the mirror's classification. It's important. Um, this is not the, we don't use this so much, but it's obvious. Uh, that we use this approach depending on the pain, depending on whether it's an uh, inferior or, or lower limb. If the fracture is um, big, bigger, if it's lithic or plastic uh, lesions are not uh, operable. We do not operate all uh, metastases, ob obviously. And in terms of surgical treatment options, we can have blocked intramedular uh, rod. We can use this shaft. We, this slide here I used from the orthopedic knowledge. This is super recent. How important it is to talk or to talk to colleagues so they refer these cases to us because survival is affected when we do not treat this. This is important because this, there are uh, articles showing the, the difference when there is and there is not fracture. So reconstruction should minimize failure risk in the long run. Uh, I was talking about myeloma, lymphoma, kidney, and breast cancer. And in cases of uh, lung, we can use a blocked uh, rod. Uh, in MSTS, uh, there was a internal um, fixation and another one uh, showing endoprosthesis. This is not, I mean, both are important. And, uh, and today, they work more with endoprosthesis than with internal fixation because these patients are living longer. The survival is longer. And we need to work, try and work as if it was a primary lesion. This is a multicenter study. This is almost a meta-analysis. And survival rate is, is worse 
when you use and block resection instead i mean when it's better with in block rese resection we need to operate as a primary tumor so wide resection versus uh, correct, correct and cement, cement. I'm not talking that you I'm not saying that you should avoid c cement and curette and these other treatments, but you should keep this in mind. Just to give you an example, this is a pathological fracture. Oh, we should always um, perform embol embolization in thyroid and kidney carcinoma. We've had cases of bleeding, uh, terrible bleedings. We had to, in to interrupt surgery. And then you use endoprosthesis. This patient here, she survived for two or three years. This is the ideal treatment. Um, breast adenocarcinoma. She had pain. The pain was unbearable, I mean, couldn't be controlled. There was a compacted fra fracture. In this case, we decided to use a uh, cement and we used a plate. She had a lung uh, metastasis. She had good uh, response considering the case. This, uh, she had, this patient had lung carcinoma in metastasis. His survival was one year and a half, but low morbidity. We stabilized the patient plus radiotherapy. Never forget about uh, radiotherapy. We need to have a close contact with the oncologist, radiotherapist. Uh, this is another example. It's important that we treat patients uh, at this moment. This is a plastic lesion, sometimes orthopedic uh, surgeons don't do anything about it. Ah, we should not treat uh, radiotherapy only. This, in this case, we should couple radiotherapy and surgery. Just to tell you what we, sh what we used to do in 1960, when we had a bone, um, bone lesion, they would be uh, admitted to a hospital. They would die away from their families. But today with an orthopedic surgery, 86% they can walk, 70% they have a good or very good uh, result or outcome and 90% have a positive psychological effect. We have better ortho orthopedics now and It has changed the situation completely with this treatment, uh, different treatment. You have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, this was uh, ATQ, uh, ATK. Okay. Uh, then thyroid adenocarcinoma, we need to treat, uh, thinking that we can increase the patient's survival this is an um, after chemo, chemo, sorry, and uh, radiotherapy. Another example: always working with the whole femur, never forgetting about that. This is a plate uh, coupled to an endoposthesis, multiple myeloma. Usually, we need to uh, operate. Some cases do not respond. Humerus uh, metastatic uh, tumor. The colleague did this. Oh, the patient will die anyway. Let's do it. But the patient survived. The lesion uh, progressed. We had to uh, recover this over the radial nerve. And this patient l lived for over three years. This is another case operated by Dr. Michel Niel. This is the plate. And with all of that, we increased the global survival increased surgical indication, and, and we have to take care about implant failures. This is a patient uh, who, was, who was 86 years old. Uh, unfortunately, renal uh, lesions and thyroid lesions, they tend to evolve. They are lithical lesions. This is a resection with plate. 
due to the lesion extension. This is cement. Um, good, if, good progression. Well, I'm finishing now. And well, my father, uh, Flavio Pli, Pini de Camargo, a pioneer in tumors. Uh, he was also a physician. He used to say that we could no longer, we could, couldn't do anything for patients with bone metastasis, but it's no longer true. We can do some things to help them. We have patients who can be helped. We have patients who can survive. And once again, let me recommend to our younger colleagues, uh, you know, I, I'm not involved. Uh, I, I once was involved with one of the chapters, but in my opinion, Mr. Chairman, this is a key book to all of us. And thank you again. Thank you very much, Professor Olavo. I'm just waiting for uh, our colleagues to present some questions, but let me make you the first question. So you don't like the myosynthesis to predict fracture and surg uh, surgery indication. So how do you perform surgery risk prediction or do you use any indication on life prognosis? Well, I'm not against it. It's a classic um, procedure, but I do not calculate this, but if you have limb lithic lesions with a lot of pain, we check prognosis, but I all, always discuss cases, not only with oncologists, radiotherapy, uh, radiotherapists, uh, but I mean, I discuss with my colleagues in oncologic or ortho. We oncologic orthopedists, we never um, do things by ourselves. We need to discuss cases with all of our colleagues. And after the patient is re the patient is referred, we need to talk to the patient, talk to the team and reach a consensus to check whether the patient is fit for surgery. Uh, so it's a multidisciplinary consensus that we must reach. Another question. In the trauma hospital, frequently there is a doubt because patient um, has a history of uh, tumor and they don't know or they don't know whether that fracture is due to trauma or is due to the due to cancer. Well, uh, we are ta you're talking ab about an, a new case. You're not talking about a referral, right? So when there's doubt, I request a biopsy. I mean, in, in case of a fracture, because then management can change. You know, it can change if it's a fracture due to metastasis, I will do one thing. If it's a fracture that is caused by osteosporosis, I will change my management. I discuss a lot uh, with spine surgeons, not uh, glauco, but usually they do not require a biopsy. They think, oh, it, let's see an MRI and it's a metastasis and they go to resection, but it's a lymphoma. They, the patient cannot undergo a big surgery or a myeloma or a proliferative myelo uh, uh, tumor. So we usually work with referrals, but when not, when it's not a referral, I would ask a biopsy. Yes, that's pretty interesting. Gustavo uh, is asking you whether if you if it's different for osteosarcoma and bone metastasis uh, for or linked to osteosarcoma well we need to try to undergo a broad um, resection even if you know uh, there is a metastatic lesion it's not so frequent it's a rare entity but then you should try a broad resection oftentimes we 
we cannot do. When there is a bone metastasis, you have new adjuvant chemotherapy. They go back to us, and then you perform broad um, resection. I wouldn't use allograft. I would use uh, endoprosthesis for the adversary, especially for teenagers or children in these cases. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Olavo. Now back to Ricardo, and let's move on with our program. Thank you, Professor Olavo. We're very pleased to count on your presence and thank you for accepting our invitation. Now, moving on, we'll listen to Professor Dr. Glauco Paucamelo from Curitiba. He'll talk to us about his experience on bone metastasis in spine. Glauco, the floor is yours. Well, let me just share aqui do toda a minha aula. Bom, inicialmente eu, eu queria share my screen. Initially, I would like to thank you very much for this invitation, yours invitation and Edgar's. Um, we've have um, we've. We've, I have uh, been working with um, oncologic orthopedics uh, for 30 years. And since the beginning, the spine was very important uh, for me. I really like this type of surgery. I've had this, um, I, this experience of 35 years in this, 30, 35 years in this area. That's my home. It has to get in a hospital. It's a hospital complex specialized in oncology in Curitiba, in Paraná. The second uh, hospital, it's a children's hospital specialized in oncology. It's a very um, important uh, team and we work very hard there. I will talk about the principles and concepts in the treatment are spine metastasis. It's hard to talk about uh, all of these metastases in 20 minutes, but I'll try and to touch about the principles and concepts because if we treat them, we can provide patients with good quality of life if you have concepts and parameters that are very well defined regarding uh, the spine. And in terms of metastasis, it's very, very common. It's different from the pi primary tumor and treatments are very, are completely different as well. We cannot compare the two types of uh, the two types of uh, treatments for primary tumors versus metastatic tumors. All tumors can eventually turn into a metastatic disease and in any bone tissue. However, the spine, the vertebral column is uh, the, the most common place for a metastasis to evolve, depending where you drain this patient. And a vertebral metastasis is an oncological challenge because 20 to 40% of tumors evolve to this type of tumor. 100% of them can develop metastatic disease in the spine, but what we see is this figure, 20 to 40 percent. And it's interesting that 20 percent of the symptoms are, they involve medullar compression. They get to us a little late or later. And the chest column, the th uh, sorry, the thoracic column is the place where we find the bulk of this compression. 70% of the compressions are located there. And we realize that 
some tumors, breast cancers, adenocarcinomas, for example, they evolve normally to vertebral metastasis, 21% of them. 14% of lung cancers evolve to uh, vertebral metastasis and also, also other tumors. And we have to talk about ethiopathogeny in Batson, in his work with rhesus uh, monkeys, he showed the existences of a venous plexus known as Batson's venous plexus, a venous plexus that can be found in the, in the whole axial skeleton, low pressure. It's a venous uh, areas with low pressures avalvular areas, which have uh, direct communications with thoracics, abdominal and pelvic organs, subject to thoracic and abdominal pressure to have an ascending or descending flow and establish then a very, uh, or easily can, or, or, or can tend to develop metastasis. The pediculus is where you have the lowest venous flow. This is where we can see uh, this slow flow favoring, also due to other reasons, it favors the implantation of bone uh, tissues uh, cells. This is a classical article of Batson says that 85% of metastases are done through a methogenic pathway. Uh, con we also have uh, uh, spinocellular um, uh, cancers are not uh, through this pathway, are through co contingency or continuity, but most of them are not. So ver vertebral metastasis, they present with pain they are due to compressive syndrome involving medullar, radicular, or uh, because the, the bone marrow is, is in, in involved or the nerves are involved. And this can lead to paraplegia because the med and from the beginning of the symptoms until the time this patient gets to us with several degrees of compression, this takes from three to six months. It takes a long time. It cannot go unnoticed. I mean, a patient with a history of cancer presenting pain in the spine, pain, pain irradiating to the limbs, something might be wrong. So if you have patients with these symptoms, it's worthwhile to investigate. There's also instability, which is a mechanical kind of pain, or you can have both things leading to pain. This is the main, uh, the main thing, and it's the beginning of the presentation. Regarding investigation, we always start with a simple radiograph, uh, x-ray. You can see the lesion, lithical or blastic, lesion, if suggests osteoporosis, and you have this image, a uh, typical sign, which the winking owl sign, as we call it, and it uh, occurs more in the pediculum, in more in lithical, lithic lesions, characteristic of some tumors and you start losing the pediculous contour, and you look at the x-ray and you can see this. It's key for us also to use MRI with and without contrast. T1 and T2 MRI, you can see the contours of the lesion, the invasion in the medullar canal, the presence or not, 
of edema around the lesion so you can have a very good notion uh, about the tumor you have the x-ray you have the mri and then you can understand how the patient is being affected by the tumor. We have some examples here of the medullar canal uh, and the compression, the medulla com medullar compression in T1 and T2. This is key for us to decide about the management, about the treatment. CT scan can also help us which type of lesion it is. Mixed, blastic, lytic, this is a mixed lesion, not, I mean, breast adenocarcinoma. Um, oftentimes it, it is blastic, not only lithic. And blastic lesions are, they have better prognosis, by the way. So, and, and you can see this, you can see the contours, the, the outlines of the, the medullar part, and you can see also the, the bone area, PET CT and scintillography is important to see the aspects of this, the skeleton uh, and PET CT can help us analyze the other organs. It's important for us to know, for us to understand how the patient is affected because each patient is one specific case, is a particular case. With the advance uh, in treatment, with uh, chemotherapy, hormone, immunotherapy, I mean, renal cancer uh, it relies a lot on that. And this, all of these treatments led to increased survival in our patients. So we need to have strategies to have better local control. And we need to develop more def definitive um, strategies for this patient. As Dr. Olavo mentioned, counting all multidisciplinary teams in oncology is key. As um, spine surgeons, we need to rely on a staff of a multidisciplinary staff complying and working together, uh, radiotherapy, are very important. Uh, clinical oncologists are, are key with new te techniques, uh, specialists in, in pain, uh, physical therapists, specialists in rehabilitation are needed, and interventionists or intervention radiologists can specifically find places where you can uh, or you, where you need to have a biopsy. With a needle, they can perform interesting things and help us and facilitate uh, in our clinical reasoning. For you to decide on which treatment to choose, we need to have clear objectives and clear parameters when it comes to this type of surgery. In terms of objectives, we need to cover five topics. One, vertebral metastasis is a palliative treatment. It's not a curative treatment. You cannot wonder and think that you are going to heal the patient and treat the patient as if it were a, a primary tumor. It's a palliative treatment and you will need to aim to improve the patient's quality of life. You need to control pain and, and improve movements, preserve or restore neurological function, which is which very important, and especially maintain vertebral uh, spine stability. You cannot uh, you, you cannot forget about instability because it's a patient with multiple lesions. It's totally different of a patient who has multiple lesions or osteosporosis and so on. If you have your objectives in check and defined, you need to consider the parameters of your treatment. You need to understand the neurological status of your patient at that moment to understand the oncological staging the status of the patient in terms of chemotherapy and radiotherapy, 
the degree of uh, spine instability. In this case, we use the spinal instability neoplastic score, SIMS, and the systemic involvement of the patient. So in terms of understanding the neurological patient, it uh, has to do about, has to do with two evaluations. The one clinical evaluation, we use the, we use Frankel's uh, ranking, the Frankel's classification and the ESCC. Frankel is the same used for trauma cases where you can check motricity, sensitiveness, whether they're present or not. In our um, reasoning, in our rationale, we understand the involvement, the, how affected the, the, the bone tissue it, it, it is. If there is a lesion in the vertebral body, how it's invasion in the vertebral body. And it's interesting that sometimes we can see, we can find one C in ESCC with invasion in the medullar canal, but we cannot correlate the situation with the Frankel. Uh, sometimes you have a Frankel B, but degree two in the ESCC. This correlation is not always um, the same. We need to analyze moment per moment. Um, so we need to understand the, on, the oncological status in terms of chemotherapy and radiotherapy, especially the difference between uh, conventional radiotherapy and stereotactic radiosurgery. This makes a lot of difference for the treatment and the survival predictive indicators. In our history, you have several Tokuhashi and Tomita scales, and you also develop an Anzunozotag predictive model. It's important to understand radiotherapy and its sensitivity, the number of fractions you use, and radio surgery has a lower number of fractions. And the fundamental difference is this one. The, the field involved in uh, conventional radiotherapy involves the medullar canal. In radio surgery, this does not happen. And we can irradiate this region, the whole tumor, and preserve that the area of the med med medulla. So, we are now using the concept of surgery by separate areas. You divide the areas. You, you treat only the tumor using radio surgery. You have the survival predictive indicators, Tomita, Tokashi, Van der Lieden, Bauer, modified Bauer, and the one that we created, that we designed. This is a predictive model of morbidity and mortality. Each indicator aims to predict survival in a timeline, and they are comparable with the same scientific significance. These two papers, they were uh, developed uh, discussing the lymphopenia, predicting 30-day morbidity, and mortality following spinal metastat metastasis surgery. Very interesting uh, papers. Instability uh, degree, SINs, uh, help us understand instability degree. We define stability as the loss of spine in integrity as the result of a neoplastic process associated to pain and related to movement, symptomatic or progressive deformity and neural affection under physiological weight. This is a sense model that we use with grades 
for each um, situation. And the systemic involvement, we need to evaluate the presence of hydroelectrolytic disturbances because these patients, they have uh, they have been suffering from these diseases for, for a long time. Sometimes they have been bound to bed for a long time. You need to analyze the comorbidities because a kidney tumor is different from a thyroid a tumor, an amygdala uh, tumor, or, or a tonsil uh, uh, tumor is very different from another. So you need to analyze this. And you also understand need to understand the Carnophis functional uh, performance uh, score. And then you have two situations. We need to choose radiotherapy without surgery or surgery plus adjuvant uh, radiotherapy. We indicate radiotherapy without surgery for radiosensitive tumor, stable spine, light medullar compression and multiple lesions. And we indicate surgery plus adjuvant radiotherapy with a prognosis estimated for over 90 days. And predictive models are very important to help us understand how long this patient will survive over 30, over 90 days, one year, two years. And it also indicate in the case of instability and uh, severe medullar compression. And radial surgery allows us to promote low, uh, smaller surgeries, good fixation of the spine, very compatible surgeries, and you have uh, compartmentalized surgery with wonderful results. Back in 2005, Patchell in a randomized trial showed the difference between surgery and radiotherapy in single treatment. And surgery was always, always better than radiotherapy alone. Today, the gold standard for spine metastasis is direct decompression plus surgery uh, when when which surgical choice well it depends on the service we tend to have uh, treatment standards as i said surgeries which are not very or so aggressive with stabilization and always radio surgery Unfortunately, a radio surgery is not for all patients, but it, this is a matter of time. So in spine metastasis, we need to re, we need to consider the known do no harm principle. We need to choose well and treat well because there is a very subtle line between you indicate a surgery and cause more harm then good. I mean, instead of another procedure and having a good survival. So it's like primum non no sere. First, do no harm, like Hippocrates said. Try and protect patients from, from doing harm. So good patient selection is crucial. And this applies to a spine metastasis. There is no doubt about it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Glauco. Thank you for your presentation. I'm very glad to know about these publications, about these articles, very interesting ones. And congratulations on your recent article, recent publication. Well, I don't know if we have questions, uh, our moderator or uh, speakers. I, we have, I have one question for you. You didn't mention this topic, but stereotactic surgery is key to try and preserve um, the functionality of uh, the, the spine. But let me talk about uh, minimally invasive procedures. Let's um, talk about patient. 
do you have experience with vertebral plasty or radio or percutaneous uh, percutaneous surgery do you think it's a uh, of benefit well during this 36 years we could catalog all all of our surgeries all of them you can imagine that we have 1085 spine surgeries we've had vertebroplasty minimally invasive surgeries and i mean and then we had the opportunity of checking what could work better for our patients for so for example radio frequency surgeries they have a very uh, subtle result or they a very label of result because with radiotherapy uh, they they have some some results but vertebroplasty, uh, when the posterior wall of the vertebra is very well defined and doesn't go into the medullar canal, everyone who does does that uh, had problem had prob had problems with this invasion of the medullar uh, area with harm. There are some specific cements uh, used for vertebroplasty very low um, uh, heating, 80, 100 degrees, and it's, they're hard to find sometimes. And patients get to our service of, in a poor condition here. Well, some patients very well selected with a very low, I um, mean, not great lesion, when it's valid, when the surgery is not so aggressive, but it's rare. And usually patients don't get to us when they get, when they start feeling pain. Yeah, but I, I've, I've done radio frequency, I've done vertebroplasty, but the thing is that you need to select the case very well. Any other question, Edgar? Um, any, anything? Just checking here. The chat window, but no question. I do. Glauco, in your hospital, who are the who are the experts? Because in, in our service, we have Douglas and Jacobson. They work with. Um, they they study orthopedics for for three years and they then they study two years of tumors. I mean, we have in, at ISESP a sub uh, specialty. They are, I don't know if you if you've heard of him, Jacobson and Douglas. They remove, he moves a cervical vertebra. It, they must be, it takes a crazy person. They are, and these two are especially crazy. Uh, what would be the, um, the education needed for, for, the, for a surgeon like this? How could we train a surgeon like this? Well, Pedro Anzuategui, I mean, the one we developed this this article with, this this paper with, we've been working together for the past five years, and now that he's starting to to, to treat spine, his uh, two years. I mean, after he was uh, after all the the, the regular uh, stu studies. He made two years in orthopedics and then five years is that devoting his studies to spine. And now he's developing these um, predictive models for the treatment of spines. We are also uh, developing uh, more studies. This is hard. This, is, this takes long. This is not simple one or two uh, spine surgeries a week and after four or five years then you can say well now i think i may i may be ready for 
uh, larger surgeries or more complicated surgeries. Okay, I agree. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, Glauco. Thank you, Professor Olavo. And thank you, Professor Marcelo, for your participation and for your time. Before we close, I'd like to remind the, the attendees that on July the 12th at 8 p.m. in Brazil, Brazil's time, we'll talk about Nezulimab, Michelle Guerti, she'll talk about the parity study, and Dr. Reinaldo will talk about mega prosthesis. Yes. And then uh, I'll, I hope to see you all then. Thank you very much. Just a second. How many? How many? How many attendees have we had? I am not sure now because we have we have some people here at Zoom and we have some people watching through the streaming. One hundred and two people. I get. Oh, that's that's good. So thank you very much. So I wish you have a wonderful evening and see you on July the 12th. Bye-bye. Good evening. Congratulations.